Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome Becky Kirsch-Witter with the Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services. Thank you for being here. Becky runs our vaccine distribution program in the state. We also have Dr. Maggie cook shamanic here today, our state medical officer. Thank you for joining us. And Jake Ganyu uh, with the Montana Department of Disaster and Emergency Services. It's been coordinating all our assistance to local communities and public health offices. Today I'll provide an update on the state's jobs recovery and our ongoing response to COVID-19. But first I'd like to address a topic that's been at the forefront for many Montanans, uh, particularly uh, for our state's veterans. And that's the foreign policy disaster and humanitarian crisis unfolding in Afghanistan. I was in Lame Deer last week in eastern Montana and a veteran approached me. Uh, he personally had served two term tours of duty in Afghanistan uh, and he approached me and asked me, quite frankly, what the hell is going on? Like many Montanans, I've been shocked at the images and reports coming out of Afghanistan. I don't have to tell you they were appalling. Regardless of your opinion on the war in Afghanistan, and regardless of whether you think the United States should continue our presence there, or regardless of whether you think we should have been there in the first place, I don't think anyone who thinks the Biden administration's approach is working. Parents are passing their children over barbed wire topped walls to U.S. forces not knowing if they'll ever see their children again. It's a heartbreaking sacrifice that I can't even imagine. But they want their kids to be safe. American citizens in Afghanistan are in danger. Unfortunately, the Biden administration is unsure how many Americans are still in Afghanistan. On one day, the Biden administration tells Americans in Afghanistan to shelter in place because the administration can't ensure their safe passage to an airport. But the Biden administration also can't ensure their safety if they do stay in place. On another day, the Biden administration tells Americans to come to the airport but some who do try to make the trip are intercepted, beaten, and whipped by the Taliban. Throughout Americans' engagement in Afghanistan, we built relationships with Afghans, particularly interpreters. We've come to rely on them as our allies in our effort to root out the terrorist safe havens and prevent terrorist attacks here on American shores. But our withdrawal was a poorly prepared and rushed calamity, and it leaves many of them at risk. These allies of ours are now in hiding. The next knock on their door could be the Taliban. A former interpreter who lives in Houston recently revealed that his sister in Afghanistan answered a knock on her door. It was the Taliban. They asked about her brother. After she told them she did not know where he was, they repeatedly shot her in the back. When she fell, they kept firing. Two of her four children were injured in the gunfire. More tragically, those four kids lost their mother that day at the hands of the brutal Taliban. We know the Taliban is hunting down Afghans who helped the United States. Afghans who wanted better lives and greater freedoms and liberties. We know, and history bears it out, the Taliban will fight against greater freedoms and liberties. The Taliban will torture, kill, and behead those who support us and their families. That's the Taliban's way. The Biden administration left our international allies, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, Germany, France, and others in the dark. And the Biden administration hastily withdrew and left 
an awful lot of American military equipment, from our Black Hawk helicopters to our Humvees and our weapons and ammo in the hands of the Taliban. Biden administration officials can't account for what military resources the Taliban has. But we've seen images of Taliban forces storming the presidential palace in Afghanistan with American-made M16 assault rifles. Americans and people throughout the world are watching in disbelief as the Biden administration's blood-stained failures continue. The president's execution of our withdrawal is a national disgrace. This is the sentiment of Democrats, Republicans, and independents throughout our country among bipartisan elected representatives in Washington, D.C. Those responsible for this debacle should be held accountable. No American citizen or ally should be left behind. The United States must get every American citizen and our allies who stood alongside us out of harm's way and to safety. And just this morning, the Biden administration has decided to do what the Taliban wants, an attempt to evacuate all remaining troops and American citizens within one week. Just one week. This has been and continues to be a preventable national tragedy. <clears throat> to that veteran in Lame Deer, to other veterans who have approached me, and to all our troops who have served overseas in Afghanistan, your service mattered. You made a difference. You made the Amer United States and the world a safer place. Thank you for your selfless service and sacrifice. And like you, I pray your efforts were not in vain. I hope all Montanans will join me in praying for the safety and security of our citizens troops, personnel, and allies in Afghanistan. Now, it's been some time since we've been together in this room, but our work extends well beyond these four walls. I've enjoyed seeing many of you on our 56 county tour, meeting with Montanans throughout our state and outside the Helena bubble. Talking with Montanans in every corner of our state where they live and work is the best way I know to do my job. And it's my favorite part of this job. As I visited over half of Montana's 56 counties since May, a few topics have dominated the conversations. Drought, wildfires, jobs, economic security, and COVID. I'll provide an update on the state's response to the drought and wildfires soon. Let me talk first about our continued recovery uh, particularly our jobs recovery. Montana's unemployment rate is the ninth lowest in the country. Since January, unemployment claims in Montana are down 87%. We were the first state in the country to end federal supplemental unemployment benefits and launch a return to work bonus program to encourage Montanans to re return to the workforce. And I'm pleased to say it's paying off. Last month, our total, un our total employment grew by more than 2,100 jobs. And since January, we've added over 8,000 jobs in the state. Our labor force participation at its, is at its highest point since January. Montana total employment and labor force are within 1% of pre-recession peak, the pre-pandemic peak. In fact, after Montana lost more than 62,000 jobs because of the pandemic, we have recovered 59,000 of those jobs. Our jobs recovery rate is the third best in the entire nation. And as we get our economy going again and get Montanans back to work, there are two elements that hold us back from a full recovery. The first is inflation. Montanans work hard for what they earn. We've seen businesses 
of all sizes raise wages to attract workers and hold on to the ones they have. While compensation has grown by about 3% between March and June, it isn't going as far because inflation is at a 13-year high. In the last year, gas prices are up 42%. Used cars and trucks are up 42%. Clothing, groceries, and housing prices, they're all up. It's putting a strain on hardworking Montana families. Even former President Obama's top economic advisor has been sounding the alarm. Very simply, fiscal policy coming out of Washington, D.C. contributes to inflation. That's why I'm concerned for hardworking Montanans that federal spending is out of control and driving up inflation. And still Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Joe Biden are now pushing an alarming $3.5 trillion spending package. It will make inflation worse and make it harder on Montanans to make ends meet. I urge them to turn off the spigot of out-of-control spending that's driving up inflation and our national debt. Because ultimately, we're paying the price for inflation now, and Washington is mortgaging the future of our kids and grandkids by passing along skyrocketing national debt. In addition to getting inflation under control, we recognize that our continued pandemic response is critical to our full economic recovery. Across the country and in Montana, we're seeing new cases and hospitalizations rise because of the Delta variant. The Delta variant is serious, and here's what we know. We know that the Delta variant impact is more severe and dangerous for unvaccinated Montanans than for vaccinated Montanans. Research shows that unvaccinated Americans are 20 times, 29 times more likely to be hospitalized from COVID than vaccinated Americans. We know the Delta variant is as dangerous as the original COVID-19 strain. We also know that it's far more contagious. This puts unvaccinated Montanans at an even greater risk of contracting COVID or becoming hospitalized with COVID. Doctor, would you like to say a few words about the recent data here in our state? Sure. Thank you, Governor Gianforte, and um, thanks for the op opportunity to provide a brief update on the Delta variant. So the Delta variant has successfully displaced the Alpha and other um, viral variants as the dominant circulating strain in Montana and in the United States at large. It accounts for around 90% of the samples that we are sequencing at the state in recent weeks. Um, Delta is substantially more contagious than prior viral strains. People infected with Delta are about two times more contagious to others. Some data suggests that the Delta variant may cause more severe illness in unvaccinated populations. And nationally, there's a focus to better understand how Delta variant behaves in children as, in, as compared to prior strains. So um, breakthrough infections occur much less frequently than infections um, in unvaccinated people. But individuals infected with the Delta variant, including fully vaccinated people with symptomatic breakthrough infections can transmit it to others. The greatest risk of transmission remains among unvaccinated people who are much more likely to contract and therefore transmit the virus. Fortunately, the COVID-19 vaccinations uh, authorized in the United States remain highly effective at preventing severe death and, or severe illness and hospitalization, um, including against the Delta variant. I'll turn it back over to you, Dave. Thank you for those comments. Thank you for your work. As the doctor acknowledged, there couldn't be a more important time to get vaccinated. The vaccines have been researched, they've been rigorously tested, they are safe, and they work. This wouldn't be possible without Operation Warp Speed. And Senator Steve Daines was instrumental in ensuring the program was a success, securing funding to allow the rapid manufacturing of vaccines and their thorough testing. But don't take our word for it. We encourage all Montanans to speak with their trusted, personal, 
medical provider about getting vaccinated and why it's important. Because at the end of the day, Montanans trust their medical provider, their doctor, and their pharmacist. Since I was sworn in, I've encouraged Montanans to get vaccinated. Just last weekend, former President Trump told Americans, get vaccinated. President Biden has encouraged Americans to get the vaccine. Officials out of Washington have told Americans to get the vaccine. Journalists have encouraged Americans to get the vaccine. And when it comes down to it though, people who are hesitant to get the vaccine don't want a lecture. They don't want, they don't respond to sanctimony and virtue signaling. They want to be talked to with respect. They trust the personal medical provider to talk to them about the vaccine, answer their questions, clear up any uncertainty, and provide them with medical guidance. They don't want to hear from me, national figures, interest groups, or even the press. It's not effective. They want to consult with medical providers they trust, their doctor, and their pharmacist. That's why I continue to encourage Montanans to talk with them about getting vaccinated. We're encouraged by the trend lines we're seeing in vaccine uptake. And I will continue to encourage Montanans to talk to their medical professionals about getting vaccinated. It's the best way to protect yourself, your friends, and your family from COVID. And let me be very clear. The state of Montana will not mandate vac COVID vaccinations, period. It's a personal choice that should be made in consultation with a medical provider. And there's good news here in Montana. We recently reached a major milestone with more than 50% of eligible Montanans now fully vaccinated from COVID-19. In addition, 56% of Montanans have received at least one dose of the vaccine. In August, Montanans are choosing to get vaccinated at a higher rate than we've seen all summer. Over this past weekend, more than 4,300 Montanans received a vaccine. Our trend lines continue to improve. And there's more good news. Yesterday, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration fully approved the Pfizer vaccine. With full approval, more and more Montanans can be confident that the vaccine has been rigorously tested and that it's safe, effective, and saving lives. But again, don't take my word for it. Talk to your medical provider if you're unsure about getting one. Uh, Becky, would you like to provide an update on our state's immunization efforts? Yeah, thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Um, Montana's COVID-19 vaccination effort continues to reach people all over the state to provide effective and safe vaccines. To date, Montana has administered vaccines to over 900,000 individuals and has fully immunized over 450,000 um, residents of Montana. Like Governor Gianforte said, Montana has now vaccinated 50% of the eligible population, along with 56% of people receiving at least one dose. <clears throat> In recent weeks, there's been a considerable uptick in the demand for vaccines around the state, and our daily administration numbers continue to increase. Yesterday, as stated, the FDA did approve the Pfizer vaccine for a two-dose series for individuals 60 and older for full FDA approval. Additionally, now, the CDC is recommending a third dose of Pfizer or Moderna vaccine to persons who are immune compromised. These third doses are available now to anyone presenting as immune compromised at any enrolled COVID-19 provider. The CDC is also looking forward to a mid-September rollout for an option to give booster doses those for those who completed their vaccine series at least eight months ago. Uh, that information is still coming to us from the CDC and has not yet been approved. Along with the increased in demands, we still in Montana have enough vaccine in our inventories to provide without cost to any individual who'd like to get vaccine a vaccine. So we are encouraging individuals who are not yet vaccinated to speak to their healthcare provider about the benefits of receiving a COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you. 
Thank you, Becky. Uh, now our collected efforts are focusing on ensuring that as many Montanans get vaccinated as possible and that our hospitals and medical providers have the resources they need to deal with the Delta variant. The Montana Department of Disaster and Emergency Services is providing hospitals across the state with PPE as well as staffing and technical assistance. And it's helping them get reimbursed by the federal government for COVID costs they might incur. Jake, would you like to say a few words about what DES is doing here in Montana? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Governor Giaforte. Here at Montana Disaster Emergency Services, our State Emergency Coordination Center has been supporting the health and medical field and community medical needs surrounding COVID-19 since March of 2020. The State of Emergency Coordination Center has a state cache of personal protective equipment and supplies available for COVID-19 response. This includes items such as gloves, gowns, masks, and medical, er medical surge items such as beds. In addition to the state resources we have, we work with our federal partners for additional surge capacity or resources. We stand ready to assist and support Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services and any local public health departments and hospitals. And finally, the impacts to hospitals and healthcare facilities can vary day to day and sometimes hour by hour. We encourage everyone to listen to their health and medical leadership in your community. We also work closely with our state's chief medical officers and CEOs and as they work in collaboration with the contracted medical staff that they've had relationships with for many years to ensure that we have enough medical staff in all the hospitals across the state. Back to you, Governor. Yeah, thank you, Jake. So I wanna close just a couple of points and then we'll take some questions. First, I wanna thank all of the health professionals who've been on the front line since day one. This has been a long road. The doctors, nurses, first responders, health officials, uh, dedicated personnel at our uh, DPHHS and DES and other state agencies. You have been tireless leaders in working to make our communities and our state safer and healthier. Second, despite all their efforts, it's unfortunate that we're taking measures to prevent the spread of the virus and to protect each other, um, including receiving the vaccine has been it's unfortunate that all of this has been politicized. It's unfortunate that now Vice President Harris, last October, said of vaccines, quote, if Donald Trump tells us we should take it, I'm not taking it, end quote. Politics shouldn't be part of this. My third point, the state of Montana will not impose mandates. One of the things we've learned over the last 18 months is that government mandates don't work. Cases of Delta variant have increased nationwide in states with mass mandates and in states without them. So let me be clear once more. The state of Montana will not impose a mask mandate and the state of Montana will not impose a vaccine mandate. As I've always, as I always have, I trust Montanans to make decisions that are best for their health and the health of their loved ones. Finally, Montana's open. We will not impose a government mandated shutdown of our state. Montanans have returned to their work sites. Others are getting back to work. Businesses are recovering, hiring, and creating jobs. The best path forward to ensure we keep making progress on our recovery is for Montanans to get vaccinated. And if they're unsure or hesitant, to talk with your medical professional about getting the vaccine. So thank you again for being here. With that, I'm happy to open it up. Jonathan. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Jonathan Anberry in Montana Television Network. One of the ways that public health officials have been talking about encouraging people to get vaccinated is by saying that if they are vaccinated and they're close contact, they're not going to have to quarantine as long but there's some concerns we've heard over the last couple of days. People aren't sure if that falls under, falls afoul of HB 702 and the vaccine discrimination policies in there. What's your administration's policy? Is it permissible to do that? Well, I think it's important that 
people take precautions in their own lives. This is why we continue to recur to the theme that uh, based on the data we have, the hospitalizations are, direct, are predominantly with folks that have been unvaccinated. Uh, again, the vaccines are the best way to protect yourself and your family. Zach? Governor Zach Kaplan, uh, Montana, right now, with some of the school districts around the state right now, we're seeing uh, some confrontations between parents and school officials, and there's sort of a, a disparate effect with ma with masks being required in school districts versus some not, and we could go in all the particulars, but there's many of them. And I, I just, um, I, I just want to ask you, with parents who are in this situation now where they either have to provide masks to their children or they're pulling their children out of schools. I understand they're calling your office as well. What would your advice be to parents in that situation, uh, particularly in some of the districts where remote learning is not an option this school year? Well, we have heard from hundreds of parents calling the governor's office and in my travels around the state. Uh, parents want their kids back in the classroom full time in as close to a normal situation as possible. Uh, we've heard from parents that they don't, they believe that masks inhibit learning. Uh, they affect the mental health of the children. Uh, and uh, uh, these, uh, they believe mask mandates in schools are counterproductive. Uh, that's why I uh, led with Superintendent Arntzen with a letter to superintendents and school boards, encouraging them to listen to the parents which I think is the best thing for them to do, and to rely on the expertise we have at uh, DPHHS to help them make wise decisions. Uh, unfortunately, the CDC has been all over the map in the guidance, and it's very difficult to follow their logic at times. That's why I encourage school boards to talk to the parents. And we'll have to take an online so question. There are currently no questions online. If you are calling in online, please dial star stick six with a question. Okay. Yes. So we encourage um, the seven oh two was designed to prevent discrimination based on vaccine status. Um, again, not all children are eligible to be vaccinated, but the data shows, and I don't know if you want to comment, doctor, on what we know about infection rates and consequences in younger children, which I think would be helpful to parents trying to make these decisions. So um, as I briefly touched on, I think nationally this is a focus area to understand how Delta variant is affecting children and how it behaves in children. So currently there's active surveillance going on looking at um, not only new infections for pediatric populations with the Delta variant, but also hospitalizations and, and outcomes. Thank you. Emma? Yeah. Hi, Ed, this is Emma Wolforce with NBC Montana. So we've had the highest labor force per, uh, participation, it's been a hard Tuesday, uh, since January, but a lot of businesses across the state are still shortening, closing hours. I report in Bozeman, we've seen lots of places closing, not being able to find staff at all. So is there anything that your office is doing to kind of help this larger issue or this underlying problem? Well, we, I agree. As I travel the state, talking to businesses, hospital administrators, school administrators, manufacturers, construction, we have a workforce shortage. That's why it was so important for us uh, to incent work rather than incenting people to stay at home. I, I'm proud that we were the first state in the country to take that step. Uh, and we've seen an 87% reduction in unemployment claims since January. People are getting back into the workforce. If you look at the underlying data, uh, to put that in perspective, we had 35,000 people in the state collecting unemployment. As of this week, that number is 4,600. Uh, we are getting back to the workforce. There's still a gap. Uh, this is why last week, um, you know, I was in Billings celebrating the Build Montana program, which exposed younger people to the trades. And I met with a young man, William, who I was so proud at 18, he's now the highest 
wage earner and his family, and he's operating an articulated dump truck there and making a great wage. After getting introduced to the idea, he came from Walmart, uh, and I was just proud of him and what's possible. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Governor. Thanks. Aaron Kimball Sanit with Daily Montana. Um, in light of the comments that you made at the beginning of the session, uh, I'm curious if you have any plans to officially open the state or welcome uh, refugees from Afghanistan, allies or, or otherwise, people who have been displaced by this crisis. Yeah, so as I said, what's going on in Afghanistan is appalling. Uh, it could not more been more poorly handled. Uh, we should not have pulled the military out prior to getting our citizens and allies out. Uh, so the priority right now has to be uh, getting our citizens and allies to safety. It's then going to be a decision for local communities to decide how we rela relocate those people. I think we have an obligation there. So do we have any questions online? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, we'll stay in touch and we'll keep you posted on the fires in the near future. Thanks for coming. Thank you for doing this.